Mark Sisson, welcome to the podcast. Those of you watching on video, we are hanging out here, beautiful summer day in Los Angeles, talking about, uh, I guess you would say it was one of, uh, formerly one of our favorite topics, yeah. endurance. Yep. Now we're kind of uh, broadening our concept of fitness into uh, longevity, promoting exercises. You talked about micro workouts on a great video we did. And uh, the, the endurance community is experiencing an awakening, which is cool. The, the fat adapted endurance training is now a legit thing. Yep. But I feel like there's probably some gray area, there's some confusion for many, many endurance athletes of how to do this stuff right. How important is diet? What about this low carb stuff where we're taught something that completely opposite what we well, thought the whole time? You and I were certainly taught something completely the opposite. Uh, and we subscribed to that carbohydrate management, glycogen management theory for the longest time. You know, what's changed in the last 10 years and probably substantially in the last five years is the research into a ketogenic diet and this idea that, number one, um, we can burn a lot more fat at high levels of output than we thought possible. Uh, I think the FASTER study proved that, uh, that you know, you can derive seven, eight hundred calories per hour from fat when you are trained to do that and, and um, have done the work to tap into that, and in so doing, you spare the glycogen reserves that have become acknowledged as so precious. Um, of course, in the old days, we felt that you know when you hit the wall, when you ran out of gas uh, in any endurance event, it was a result of depletion of glycogen and the muscles telling you it's time to stop. I think one of the things that Tim Noakes explored uh, extensively was this central governor theory of the brain, which suggested that it's not the muscles that are telling you to stop. It's the brain and its lack of glucose and its lack of that fuel that keeps it running that says, hey, we're in an emergency situation, we're going to die, pull over to the side of the road and take a nap, right? But one of the things that's come about as a result of this um, ketogenic um, inquiry that we've done and this sort of fat adaptation, keto adaptation, is acknowledgement that the brain runs really well on ketones. And so if you can train your muscles to burn much more fat and if you can train your brain to rely more on ketones then when you get into a race situation and when you are going uh, digging deep and going all out for long periods of time the fact that your brain is now being fueled by ketones which are basically there as a result of the fat metabolism and so you don't really run out of ketones the way you run out of glucose then the brain is able to say hey, it's not that big a deal, we don't need to pull over and take a nap, we can maybe plow on and soldier on through this event burning fat. And then that's the real exciting new frontier of this whole thing. I think one of my favorite examples is Sammy Inkinen and his wife Meredith uh, to, 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 to raise awareness for the cause of uh, low carbohydrate lifestyle. They rode a rowboat for 42 days from San Francisco to Hawaii, yeah. human-powered rowboat, yeah. and they were eating uh, over 80% fat diet with the provisions they had on the boat. Yeah. But proving that you don't have to constantly uh, try to top off that glycogen it, tank yeah. and absorb as much fuel as possible, because it's super difficult to do that when you're exercising. Right, the concept of carbo-loading, which used to be um, you know, endemic, and I say that um, you know, in a real clinical term, uh, in the endurance population, which is basically I got to carbo load every day because I'm going to go back and do this same kind of, type of training every day. Well, the training regimens have now shifted to the point that we're not going out and practicing running six minute miles every day. Um, hopefully actually, not. Hopefully not. We're training in a way that builds these different systems. So, you know, we're using uh, 180 minus your age as a maximum limit when we're building a base. Uh, the reason for that is that we know that 180 minus your age is that heart rate at which whatever amount of work you're doing you're getting most of your energy from fat and we know that through the oxygen throughput um, and so some people who can train day in and day out at a much higher heart rate than 180 minus your age and would go well wait a minute I you know I did what you said and now I'm, I'm like I'm running or I'm riding so slow I can't possibly be getting any benefit from it why is it that you're making me do this? And the answer is because, well, you've proven that you're really good at burning sugar. You're really good at burning carbohydrate. We know that because you can go long periods of time 
at higher heart rates and then come back and do it again the next day and the next day and the next day as long as you refill those glycogen stores overnight, carbo load. But what, you're, but what we've determined is you suck at burning fat. And so when we try to um, retrain our bodies to build this metabolic machinery to burn fat at a much higher rate, we not only have to shift the diet and cut carbs from the diet, but we also have to shift the training to slide it back a notch to the point where whatever amount of work we're doing, as long as we don't exceed 180 minus your age, plus or minus five beats, depending on certain other factors, but, but really that's sort of the, the, that's, that scale. And then what we find is that over time you become more and more efficient so that, let's just say you were somebody who could run 630 miles or you could ride 22 miles an hour on a bike. In a race. You know, in a race. Yeah. And you could do that uh, for hours at a time, as long as you had gels and carbo products and stuff like that. You know, so now we know that you could do the work, but were you being efficient at it? Were you able to derive energy from burning fat? Um, were you maximizing your own ability to, to increase power and speed? Or were you, um, you know, were you sort of hamstrung by that, that um, throughput of just carbohydrate? So when we rebuild the body, when we retrain the body, when we build a metabolic machinery to burn fat, we not only have to do it through withholding carbs in the diet, but we do it through this, this um, opportunity of um, 180 minus your age. And then so when you could do 630s or you could ride 22 miles an hour, but now you, you limit yourself to the heart rate, the max heart rate of 180 minus your age, and you go, wait a minute, I'm only running like 11 minute miles now and I'm running, riding 15 miles an hour. But over time, if you adhere to that principle and, and you use that as the guiding principle and you never exceed that heart rate, say in six or eight weeks of base building, then you, you find they become more and more efficient. And those 11-minute miles become, they become 10-minute miles. They become 9-minute miles. They become 8.30s and 8s. While still burning fat. While still burning fat. While still, and now you're running 7.30 miles at a much lower heart rate than you ever raced at. So you've become clearly and demonstrably a more efficient fat-burning machine. You're now using, you're deriving most of your energy from, from fat and you're using your carbohydrates or your glycogen very sparingly. And what that means is that when you get in a race, now when you're neck and neck with your competitors and you know that they're getting you know, 85% of their calories from carbohydrate and you know you're getting 85% of your calories from fat, you know that when you put the hammer down and you, and you, and you increase the pace a little bit, you will drop them. And that's really where I think that you know, we're seeing these amazing breakthroughs in at least the longer distances events, you know, the, in the, in the hundred milers uh, and things like that. And, I, and we're starting to see it now in, in triathlons. Well, also the, the stress impact of the workout <coughs> is so much lower when you're in that fat burning state. You're, you're generating less reactive oxygen species from burning the glucose and the stress hormones that are pumping through your bloodstream as you're performing at a higher heart rate all the time. So all of a sudden you come home from these workouts, whatever pace it was, if it's 7.30 or whatever you're, if it's 11 minute miles at the start, but you come home and you feel fine. Yep. And so you're able to build and build and build. It's kind of like, I guess, going to school and being in the right grade. So you go home and you learn something, you go back the next day, you feel good, you keep learning rather than pushing a kid into high school, yep. they're gonna fall apart. But I think that's what's happening to so many athletes as they get excited, they plunge into the sport, they realize how difficult it is and grueling it is. It's fun to watch on TV and they want to be that person that can make it to the finish line. But in real life, it's just too stressful to be in a, I guess you'd call it a, a, a sugar, a sugar burning endurance experience. Well, and we, you know, we talk about in primal endurance, the black hole of training that, that um, so many athletes spend so much time at heart rates that are too high. Uh, and the net effect is you know, you are not trying necessarily to practice to hurt, although that's what it, it appears they're doing. What you want to do when you're training is you want to build these different systems. You want to build a strong aerobic system. You want to build maximum sustained power. That means you have to spend time in the gym actually doing weights. You know, and this is sort of counterintuitive to everyone who ever ran a triathlon or, or a marathon in, this, in the you know, 80s and 90s. You want to build these various systems so that when you put them together, they come together as this, as this race pace thing, but it's certainly not something you would want to do every day. And yet it seems that people try to go out and do 85% of their max VO2 every single day in their workouts because it feels like they're doing the work and it feels like they're, you know, it feels like they're 
they're actually working, but the reality is they're not making improvement. And if you don't make improvement, and all you're doing is going out and hammering yourself every day, you get into this black hole of training, which eventually causes burnout and fatigue, um, disillusionment, because you know you think, well, you know, I thought I was going to be better than this, and I'm doing the work, so I must deserve it, but it's not happening. Well, in many cases, it's not happening because you haven't put the component parts together in the right way. Uh, speaking of that, the big problem of excess body fat, and we hear from thousands of endurance athletes complaining that they have 5, 10, 12, or 18 extra pounds of body fat, even though they're training for 10, 12, 14, 18 hours a week. And that part is just, it's nonsensical to think someone who burns that many calories can't get a few last pounds off. But again, it's because of the carbohydrate dependency. It's, it's that, and, and I, the irony there is that these are the same people who spend, you know, a thousand bucks on a, on a gra graphite piece of equipment. A thousand that, extra dollars. Extra dollars. To save to 12 to ounces. Save 12 ounces on their bike or something. Hold on, let me get a calculator out. Yeah. What if you, you know, quit eating all that sugar and drop seven pounds? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, obviously the one sort of, the area that really becomes the sweet spot for all of this is not only are you get, getting better at burning fat, you're getting better at burning your own stored body fat, so you trend toward your ideal body composition. So those two things go hand in hand. You, you drop that excess body fat because you use it as fuel because you're, you're getting better and better at using it as fuel. Well, speaking of hand in hand, I mean, the, the, the most important point probably to take away is that the interplay between your diet and your training patterns. And if you screw up either one, in other words, let's say, I'm going to go keto. Uh, I read the great book, Keto Reset Diet. I'm all in. And then you're going out there and doing black hole training. You are guaranteed to fail because you're burning all those carbohydrates during the workout. Well, uh, other way around, if you start training uh, sensibly, but you're still coming home and eating the ice cream and the jelly beans because it's part of your habit, it's going to be really difficult to get fat adapted because right. you're going to be spiking insulin over and over and all that hard work in the exercise is going to be negated. So it really is sort of a, a complementary approach where, boy, you modify your diet, you're going to get faster, period. Right. Um, and conversely, you know, if you read the Primal Endurance book, but you kept eating a lot of carbs, you'd have the same issue, right? Right. So these, these outlier performers that are doing these incredible things and paving the way and kind of making it seem possible to the average person, it's really interesting what's going on where you can almost become bonk-proof now where you don't need uh, outboard Ex fuel. Extraneous fuel during a race, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, if someone's new to this and just listening to this thing or have he heard a little bit about it, uh, how is that how is that possible when you're working hard for four hours on a bike ride and you're not taking in a gel every 20 minutes at your watch beeper what's well, going know, on physiologically well, first of all before gels existed before gatorade uh -huh. existed in the, in wait, the wait were you training back then yes so was i <laughs> yeah wow so you know what did people do they drank water and then they they maybe a coke if they were lucky they toughed yeah. it out so right. um you know it's like some people assume what, that we've only been able to do this because of the gels and the carbohydrate management and all that stuff. But, but you know, for millennia before, before, well, for millions of years before this, as, as you know, subsistence hunters and gatherers and spending time tracking an animal for four hours in the heat um, and no and gels, no gels. Uh, this was all based on on the human ability to generate energy from stored body fat. You know, we have this beautiful system that allows us to um, to find a source of food and then we have this system that's in our brain wired for us to overeat so we we of necessity overeat part of that system also involves converting the excess calories into energy that we carry around with us it's beautiful it's amazing that we can carry excess energy around by the way stored conveniently right on the center of gravity in the hips and the thighs and the butt so all these things make perfect sense in the context of of evolution and and yet the other part of it that makes sense is our ability to take that same fuel out of storage and burn it combust it for energy as needed so all we're doing as endurance athletes is we're taking this innate ability that we were born with this genetic predisposition that we have to be, be very good at burning fat and to be really good at creating ketones and for our brains to be using these ketones to to drive the brain and keep the energy levels up in the brain um, we're just we're just finding means within modern day um, mechanics of bicycles and running and swimming to be able to convert all of that tapped innate 
DNA knowledge in our brain to become better at burning fat. It's just buried under a sea of insulin, really, because when you're in that carbohydrate dependency diet, the fat is locked away, inaccessible, uh, even to uh, an athlete out on the road, which they, they should have, if, you're, if you have 12% body fat and you weigh 180, you can go for 997 miles without needing any more energy, right? Yeah, but, and if you weigh 180 and you have 12% body fat, you know, it's, that's a real struggle to be running in the, you know, in, in the lava fields of Kona <laughs> or on the, in, in a Tour de France situation. Yeah, I mean, the energy's there, but it's yeah. locked away. Yeah. And so I guess we could ask, uh, you know, what, what's, a, what's a transition step that one can take if they're going to embrace this, buy into it, like Dr. Lindsay Taylor, our, yeah, our wonderful yeah. sidekick, and she said, I read the book, yeah. I thought about it for a while, I took some notes, you know, she did the whole academic process, yeah, yeah. being that that's her, that's her yeah. world, but then finally made the decision, okay, this kind of makes sense, so I'm going to try it, and quit stuffing my face before a workout, yeah. and seeing if, you know, somehow that, that fat-burning capability can be awakened, our genetic birthright. And? And great, great success. So Good. she's a ketogenic Ironman right. triathlon finisher now. Yep. And there's quite a bit of people. The wonderful stories come in. It's awesome. We read about them on the podcast and all that. But again, I'm, I'm thinking we're talking about 7% or 12% of the field. Everyone else is still stuck in that, in that mode where they're just desperately trying to consume more sugar or hold on to the sugar they had and not that good at burning fat. So, you know, what could be some step-by-step -step approach here to do it in a way that's not going to cause a backslide and a failure? Uh, well, I mean, if you just, if you don't have to go all in for this to have um, um, significant improvement in your performance. Uh, you can start by getting rid of, you know, industrial seed oils, by getting rid of uh, grains, by getting rid of uh, excess sugars and eating real food. Um, you can okay, one sec. With this industrial seed oil, yeah. just to be clear, that's not a carb, but it has no. a disastrous impact on our fat burning. Why? Uh, well, first of all, these are man-made frankenfats <laughs> man -made. that uh, are highly uh, processed and adulterated, and they don't really represent the sorts of uh, fats that you would see incorporated into the body, either as fuel or as... Um, uh, fats that you would find, uh, say, in the membranes of cells. Um, and yet when we consume them, they do get incorporated into the membranes of cells, rendering those cells less efficient, in many cases uh, more insulin resistant. Uh, so there are a lot of reasons not to be consuming uh, corn oil, soybean oil, canola oil, things like that. Uh, so that's, that's one of the uh, in initial steps that I would take um, in Those are commonly found in like salad dressings and stuff, right? Oh, they're everywhere. I mean, if you eat at restaurants, I mean, most restaurants will be using those sorts of oils. So you might yeah. even eat in a great restaurant and have uh, a, a fabulous salad get ruined by the types of oils that they chose to use in the dressings. Is it true you carry your own salad dressing? I carry my stores? own salad dressing with yeah. me, yes. Uh, so, again, by, by the, the, to get started in this whole, you know, process, um, that's the first step. And then get ri getting rid of um, added sugars, sweetened beverages, things like that. Um, grains and eating real food and at the same time adjusting your workouts to not be in that black hole but to be cutting back 180 minus your age you know your maximum aerobic uh, efficiency uh, level and stay in that zone and don't exceed that zone for weeks at a time until you become competent at uh, at cranking out the miles either on the bike or running or swimming or whatever it is you're doing and becoming more efficient at burning fat uh, these are these, and then you can spend some time in the gym, and you can lift weights, and these are all things that you can do uh, that are going to improve your efficiency and have the effect of improving your race performance. The, there's no way it doesn't. Um, you know, I, we we have um, a lot of friends that we've told about this process and who have begrudgingly adopted it, and then they're like, "Oh my God, Mark! I mean, I used to hit the." You know, the Saturday ride, and we for two and a half hours, we'd hammer each other to death on Saturdays, and, and I'd come home and I'd take a nap, and I never got any better, and then I did your, did your process, and now I'm, I'm, I'm killing those guys up every hill uh, on those rides because I did the, you know, I, I, I went back and, and became a fat-burning beast, became good and fat-adapted and keto-adapted, and um, I wasn't as burned out. I'm, I'm getting more uh, training done on less training time, uh, and better results. So I think there are, um, 
you, like a lot of people have stayed away because they thought, well, if you know, I don't have a year to invest in this transition. I can't, <laughs> I can't, you know, go through this process where I'm, I'm not as good for three months <laughs> while I'm going keto. Your racing is too important to you to, yeah. to look yeah. long term. Yeah. yeah. So I think now I, I, I'm, I've come to that place where I really feel like, um, especially if you start in some in, in the off season, you'll come into the season stronger and better at, at and more fat adapted and more keto adapted. So the, the keto would be the highest level of sophistication after you ditched the uh, uh, the grain sugars and the bad oils and made some progress. How do we how do we make that progress to where we can? consider becoming a ketogenic endurance athlete I mean it's not it's not a sudden thing you have to kind of well I would that. I would I would go to it gradually and I, I'd, be, I'd go primal first I'd cut my you know carbs down to you know 100 150 a day for a while get comfortable with that uh, and then there's a point at which I'd want to find maybe 50 or 60 or 70 grams of carbs a day that I can cut from that mm. and get down to 50 or 60 grams total of carbs a day while I'm training um, again, don't, don't uh, try to do any of the hard stuff yet. Um, this is during your base building phase, and it takes four to six weeks to get comfortable with that. But in the process, you are becoming good at burning fat. You're burning off your own stored body fat, so you're, now, you're probably losing a little bit of, of excess body fat, but maintaining muscle, and that's important. Uh, you can spend time in the gym building power and building strength so that when you do decide to ramp up your training, when you do decide to start throwing some intervals in there or some tempo work, uh, you have the capability, you have the strength, uh, you have the power, and you have the fat burning capacity. Now, once you've arrived at that level of uh, proficiency, when, once you become that metabolically efficient that you can get most of your energy from, from fat, then it's okay to carbo load the night before a race or the night before a hard interval workout or something like that. So you might say, well, you know, I'm keto for the most part, but then uh, tomorrow I'm going to be doing. Uh, you know, four uh, uh, times t three mile climbs up Sunset uh, or up S Sunset Highlands. Or what, right. what, what, Palisades, Palisades Drive. Highlands. Yeah, Those yeah, of you in Los we, Angeles that's know that the road. one that we used to do that used to be the killer. Um, and that's fine. Then you can load up with some sweet potato the night before and fill your glycogen stores and, and have not only the fat that you already know how to burn, but the glycogen ready and available for that uh, glycolytic work that you're going to do the next day. Um, the beauty of that is you blow through that glycogen. You don't have to re refill those stores. You don't have to carbo load for the next day mm. for two reasons. Number one, you're going to fill your glycogen stores anyway. You don't need to carbo load to refill glycogen stores. And number two, I probably don't want you going hard again the next day. Mm. You know, there's no reason to go hard two days in a row. So if you went hard enough to require uh, a full glycogen store the night before and you did that hard workout, take the next day easy. Just have it be an easy fat burning day. And you, you're promising that we're going to be able to reload glycogen without slamming the. Uh, yeah, so you reload glycogen. After. The body reloads glycogen automatically. You know, we have this thing called gluconeogenesis and glyconeogenesis, and we're able to refill glycogen stores from a high fat, moderate protein diet. The only issue, the only, the only challenge there is instead of filling, refilling it in, say, 16 to 24 hours like would happen in the old days with carbo loading now it takes 36 hours but you're still ref mm -hmm. you're, you're refilling glycogen stores um, and so maybe two days later you're ready to go hard again and you're not limited by your glycogen stores but you've done it without having to carbo load and when when you carbo load you again of necessity you increase insulin you cut off um, ketogenesis and you inflammation oxidative all stress, that stuff starts to re sugar. starts to re-enter the picture uh, yeah Kyle Kingsbury our, our MMA uh, friend with his own podcast made a great statement that stuck with me that um, maybe the the low carb diet and the gluconeogenesis is the best way to restock glycogen as opposed to slamming carbs because you're only going to restock exactly what you need. Yep. Whereas the, the average exerciser who wants to reward themselves yeah, after yeah. a 20 mile run is going to eat more than enough carbs. Foie gras. We talked about the Overfilled. excess body fat yeah. <laughs> issue, and that's yeah. exactly how you get it, especially we know what it's like to feel depleted. Anyone who's, who's, yep. who's been out there, when you're depleted, your brain and your appetite center are all messed up, and they're wanting you to overeat because of the, the, the life or death 
fight or flight response of, yep. of getting depleted. Exactly. No, if you're a sugar burner, if you become so dependent on carbohydrates your whole career, your whole life, that you now run low, um, not only does your brain go, wow, we got to eat some more carbs, but your brain also sends a signal to your adrenals to send out cortisol and start this process of um, tearing down muscle tissue to make new uh, glucose from right. the amino acids in the muscle. So it's, it's a catabolic process. And that's the reason why I could eat 6,000, 7,000, 8,000 calories a day it's as, true. A, as a marathon runner. Uh, and I weighed 30 pounds less than I weigh now because I couldn't keep muscle on. Uh, because, I was, because I was so carb dependent that every time I ran through my carbohydrates and ran through the wall and kept going, my brain would tell my adrenals to secrete cortisol, which is a stress hormone, uh, and it would cause my the, the tissue breakdown of the non-essential tissue, typically chest and arms, and that's why every runner you ever see has almost no you know, upper musculature. It's not they sexy. Just can't, it's not sexy. They look, uh, you know... They can't hold on yeah. to it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if, if that's getting too sciency right now, I want to... You can pause the button if you want and reflect on this because this is super important because there's so many endurance athletes that are doing their thing in the name of health but destroying their health because these catabolic processes and this constant stimulation of cortisol is one of the markers of accelerated aging. So it's the opposite of the intended benefit of your workout routine. Yeah, it's ironic that people enter into these um, triathlon events uh, under the guise of wanting to, um, you know, engage in an anti-aging program, which includes training and completing an Ironman. When in fact, um, in many cases, it's, it's antithetical to an anti-aging program. It's in fact increasing inflammation, increasing oxidation, uh, tissue breakdown. Uh, of course, the more time you uh, dedicate to going straight in a line, the less time you dedicate to going side to side or in circles, uh, your mobility gets compromised, and that's one of the defining characteristics of, of uh, longevity, is increased mobility. So we see a lot of um, ex-runners who can barely walk now because of their hips, uh, have had you know, hip, hip replacements, knee replacements, or we see cyclists you know, who walk bent over because of the time they spent uh, on their bike and did not you know, their, their hip flexors are so short and tight that they, and they never spent the time fixing them. So there's this, um, there's an issue with engaging in any sort of endurance activity uh, as an anti-aging strategy because they're almost counter, counterproductive um, and, and exclusionary. You can do it, and that's, again, why we wrote Primal Endurance. We wrote it for people who said, I don't care what you say, Mark, I want to finish mm -hmm. a marathon. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a uh, uh, bucket list item, I, it's a notch in my belt and I want to do that. And we said, well, okay, we'll help you do it, but here's how you're going to do it. You're going to do it in a kinder, gentler fashion that isn't going to ruin your health and may in fact you know, enhance your, uh, your uh, longevity. Um, but probably isn't going to get you to, if you do it that way, isn't going to get you to the, you know, the max of your capacity. But you and I know for ourselves and for a lot of our friends, um, you know, as Mark Allen f famously said one time, he thinks he left several of his years out there on the, on the Queen K Highway in Kona. You know, you dig that deeply and you go to the well that often, there's a cost involved. So now trying to uh, mitigate this, and we've hit the, uh, the, the big picture items of the, the diet, getting rid of the junk, trying to eat more primally, ancestrally, slowing down that, that cardio. And a couple times, maybe we could end with that final piece of the puzzle you could comment on. How do we introduce that intensity in an intelligent manner so that it can really benefit us? Because I think the mentality is, well, geez, I, I got to run 26 miles, so I got to get up and run every day to practice so I can finish this marathon. But now we're seeing that hitting the gym and doing box jumps and loading your body with the, the, the squat bar and, and doing the, the, the resistance stuff has a tremendous benefit to endurance performance if it's done properly. Uh, a, a great example is you just brought up uh, Kyle Kingsbury. I think he just tried. He just did some ultra endurance event. Oh, on, these guys, Kelly Starrett, with 225 pounds, did the on double almost, dipsy on almost no training. Yeah, um, yeah, but they did it because their training was life training. It was mobility training, and it was all the other stuff that they were able to put together. So they didn't have to go out and run 
uh, whatever, what's the double dipsy? 14 miles? It's this huge climb. In, but it's 14, involved, I think it's 14 yeah, miles. Lots of climbing. ocean and back you know, over or these, high mountain. Or these, you know, uh, 50K ultras yeah. that people are t taking up. Um, as long as you do the training in between and you do the, you, the appropriate amount of uh, dietary work, the appropriate amount of, of strength work, um, some interval training, and then a little bit or, you know, some amount of long distance, oh, what we used to call over distance work. Mm -hmm. Uh, but in terms of incorporating now the strength and speed work, you just got to be smart about it. You have to be prepared for it. So I think spending time in the gym and building the muscle, muscles first, and then at the same time having built that, that aerobic base now gives you the, the raw materials, if you will, to go out and hit the track and do some intervals. Uh, what you and I have discovered in the past couple of years is that you don't need to string those intervals together with as minimal rest as possible. The fact is that by doing... Uh, a fast interval session and then resting significantly two to three minutes sometimes, not 20 or 30 seconds, and then doing the next one, uh, you get as much benefit and a greater uh, capacity for recovery and regeneration from that. Yeah, I mean, it's also, uh, you know, approximating the challenge of the race and training is the number one best way to become competent to, to whatever it is, if it's a marathon or a triathlon where you're trying to go fast in each event, but doing that few and far between, and having those special occasions where you're preparing for a race and giving mm -hmm. yourself a maximum effort workout, but the problem is we've been trying to stack up so many of those yep. that we fall apart and break down. So I guess if we put this together, most of the training is done at a comfortable, aerobic, fat burning heart rate. So we're a healthy human being that's building health and vitality through training then we're cleaning up the diet. Then we're throwing in some intensity stuff, but doing it in a way there's... Same thing, though. It's comfortable and it's healthy. There's, there are ways to do interval training mm. that, are, that are relatively comfortable. I mean, yes, they hurt for the 30 seconds or the mm -hmm. one minute or whatever, but it doesn't have to be um, hurt and then, and then you know, not recover fully and hurt again and mm. then break yourself down in a workout. So I'm, I'm suggesting there are ways to do the interval training, which is intense. Mm -hmm. and does require an all-out effort, but there are ways to do it that are also, you could, you could also consider comfortable. Well, you've been telling me this for 30 plus years, uh, inspired by the Olympic runners that uh, hang out in LA that come to the same track where we're doing our workouts and we watch them with such a leisurely approach to these extremely high performance, high intensity workouts, but they, they do their explosive stuff and then there's a lot of downtime and jogging and stretching. And we thought we were so tough because we could only, we only had to rest for 30 seconds and then do another half mile. But this kind of workout leads to possibly not a great return on investment because it's too tiring. It's yep. too much breakdown. Yep. Well, it depends obviously on your sport as well. I mean, clearly what they were doing work for, um, you know, 100 meters or 110 hurdles or whatever. Uh, they were even um, uh, pole vault. Uh, and you do have to train somewhat differently for 5K, 10K marathons. But the concept is still the same, that you want to make your training uh, as, um, first of all, as scientifically, as validated as possible. So you want to, again, we, you don't want to just beat yourself against the wall and say, well, I just worked so hard, I deserve to run I'm fast. I'm destined to succeed. I'm destined to succeed. <laughs> you want to be smart about it, and you want to not get injured, and you want to see improvement um, over the course of, of time. Uh, and so many people that you and I know, um, even to this day, it's like, you know, they run five or six marathons a year, and they're all 345. Well, Jesus, I mean, if you're not going to run 330, why are you even continuing to train? But there's like this dream that, well, if I keep, if I keep, if I, if I work even harder, right, and if I feel even worse in my training, um, and if I suffer even more in my training, maybe I'll be able to make that breakthrough and take 15 minutes off my marathon time. When in fact, it really requires a wholesale revision of your training strategy, go back to square one and go, what, is it, what are the component parts of my training that I'm deficient in? And, and, and I'm going to work on those. And in most cases, the number one deficiency is fat burning. Mm -hmm. You are pretty good at burning sugar. You are terrible at burning fat. Let's go back and work on that first of all. And that's where the increase in, in, in performance is going to come. And there's the math test to validate everything. If you're insecure, you're, you, you can't stand slowing down so much. You want to describe how to, how to do a simple tracking of your improvement that's right there in front of your eyes on the, on the paper, proving that you're getting more efficient. Uh, well, there are several different math tests you can do. The one that I like to uh, refer to is one, you do a, you do a bit of a warm-up, 
And um, let's just say you call out your uh, 180 minus your age. And, you know, in my case, it's uh, going to be uh, 113. Holy crap. No, 114. Uh, call it 115, 115 beats a minute. So then I'm going to run around. I'm going to run around the track for a mile, and I'm going to not. Ex I'm going to try and hold 115 beats a minute on my heart, and I'm going to see what kind of time I run. And uh, if that time generates, say, uh, an overall finished time for the mile of 10 minutes, that's, there's my benchmark. Now, if I train appropriately and I go out <coughs> in a few weeks or months and I do that same workout and I, and I hold the same heart rate and now if I'm if, if at 115 beats a minute now I can complete that mile in 8 minutes and 45 seconds now I know I become more efficient. Um, do it every couple of weeks and over time maybe that 115 beats a minute now gets me down to 745 or 730 minute miles and now I know that my for the same amount of work because my heart was working the same amount when I was running 10-minute right. miles as I'm... Uh, right. But it's, the heart is working based on demand that's created by the work you're doing and by the amount of fat you're burning. The heart doesn't... Uh, you know, it, 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 you want to put oxygen through and you want to be efficient and you want to burn fat. And that's when the heart goes, yeah, I got this. I can supply enough oxygen to burn fat in the mitochondria and get us to a 7-minute and 30-second mile. So if you haven't done the work, if you haven't built the metabolic machinery, if you haven't adjusted your diet to become better at burning fat, if you haven't trained at that 180 minus your age level, then your body's just trying to pull in sugar from wherever it can and it's going crazy with trying to get fuel to accomplish the task that your brain is telling it to do. <laughs> so uh, it doesn't have to be that difficult. It can actually be much more convenient and, and user-friendly uh, and not impact negatively on your longevity. Slow down to go faster. The primal endurance approach. Clean up your diet. Throw in some hard stuff once in a while, but not all the time. Yeah. That's the deal right there. Thank you for watching, listening. <laughs>